Uh, my name is Matthew Werwood, and I work at the Centre for 21st Century Skills at Education Connection. Now, as the name implies, we care very much about six critical skills that we feel form the foundation for success in the 21st century. And I'm here to talk about one of those skills in particular, because it's a skill that I care about, it's a skill that I'm passionate about, and some people who know me may say I've become a little bit obsessed with it. And that is creativity. Now, we've seen Ken Robinson, and we know there's a tremendous amount of talk related to creativity at the moment. We've got people like David Florida, who's writing about the emerging creativity class and how it's leaving everybody else behind. Daniel Pink writes about creativity being a premium in the world, where routine knowledge can so easily be outsourced away. And Howard Gardner includes the creative mind in one of the five minds of the future. So why have we got so much talk about creativity? Well, President Obama refers to this period as our generation Sputnik. And for those of you that are familiar with this period in history, you'll know that in 1957, when the Soviet Union launched the first satellite into orbit, the Western world were baffled. They were confused. Why was it that Russian rocket technology was so much more advanced than ours? And this was immediately perceived as a threat to national security, but more importantly, economic supremacy. Now, in the aftermath, there was a blame put on the part of scientists and engineers for a lack of creative thinking. And this eventually translated into a fault in the education system. And we saw the federal government increase their role in education and put significant amount of funds to the development and promotion of science, mathematics, and engineering as part of the National Defense Education Act. Now, I'm not here to talk too much about Sputnik, but I'm here to talk about something else that happened during the 1950s. And that was the beginning of the study of creativity. Now, there had certainly been talk about creativity before the 50s, but it was in relation to I, um, IQ. And if you had a high IQ, you're expected to be creative. Well, an American psychologist called Joy Guilford didn't believe this to be true. And so he stood up in front of the American Psychological Association, and as part of his inaugural address, he said that he's going to go and embark on a journey into the study of creativity, because he believed that the neglect of this subject by psychologists is appalling. Well, I'm here to say today that I believe from the bottom of my heart that the neglect of this subject by education is appalling. And the reason why I'm saying that is that there has been a tremendous amount of knowledge generated about the creativity phenomena that it really annoys me when I pick up an article and read that 75.5% of student teachers are graduating thinking that creativity is something that cannot be taught. I mean, this really bugs me. It's as if saying that um, not all students have the skills to read and write because I just don't think it's factually correct. This is an image taken of a class that I attended at the International Center for Studies in Creativity. And it's a timeline of the subject of creativity since the 1950s. And all of the different color post-its represent different decades. Now, on these post-its are theories and models from scholars who are demonstrating how you can teach people to think more creatively, and more importantly, do it successfully. They've proven that they can do it successfully. Now, I want to just bring out one of the scholars that's on that wall a lot. And his name is E. Paul Torrance. And he's kind of like known as the father of creativity. So I've got some nods in the audience. So obviously, people know E. Paul Torrance, which is great. And for those of you that don't, I would, um, I would probably recommend three things if you're interested in the teaching of creativity in the classroom. The first thing I would say is probably look at defining creativity for yourselves. What, what does it mean for you when you go about and say, I want you to be more creative to your students? The other thing is I might suggest that you go and engage your students into an activity where they explore a class definition for creativity. And from experience, this is kind of like a fun activity um, with the students, because they definitely like taking ownership of that word that I've discovered. And the other thing that I would say is go and explore the work of E. Paul Torrance, because he did some really cool things. And one of the things that he was able to do was identify a creativity skill set. And he did that by studying a group of people called the Beyonders. And he called them the Beyonders because their creative accomplishments went beyond expectations. And he was able to identify a common set of characteristics that he believed was associated with their ability to go beyond their creative accomplishments, okay, to do something out of the ordinary. And so um, he developed something called the Torrance Incubation Model of Teaching and Learning. Now, unfortunately, I don't have too much time um, to go into this model into depth, but I do want to just point out um, two important things, or rather one important thing, two important statements on there, um, that we've been able to apply, at our work, um, uh, apply for our work at the Center for 21st Century Skills. And that is this idea that you can integrate the, the teaching of one of these creativity skills 
while you're having students learn the content, okay? And I think this is a really, really exciting um, opportunity um, because we've got so much pressure for students to learn the content, okay? Especially all these examinations around the state and the federal government still looking for accountability. If they're gonna give away all this money, they wanna make sure that um, students' test scores are going up. But the great thing is that doesn't mean, necessarily mean that we have to stop teaching creativity. And the other thing that I think we've got going on at the moment, and I think it's been referenced in pretty much every presentation so far, is we've got this explosive growth of digital technologies. And I think digital technologies really provide us with a great opportunity right now to integrate the teaching of creativity in the classroom. Because when they're integrated into a project-based learning environment, not only do um, technologies challenge us to rethink how we deliver instruction, but they also demand that students demonstrate their knowledge of the content by inventing something new. And so what I would like to do now is just take you through an activity that, activity that we developed at the Center for 21st Century Skills by using 3D virtual worlds. Now, unfortunately, time's not going to allow me to digress and talk about all the fun we've had with 3D virtual worlds, but it's definitely a process when you start to integrate new technologies into the classroom. It's a learning experience. You have to play with the technology. You have to then experiment with the technology and try and determine how you feel it can be of value in your classroom. So one of the things that we did with 3D Virtual Worlds is we definitely appreciate its learning environment um, and being able to bring multiple school districts together in the same online community. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment in, in relation to the 10 Cube Challenge. But the other thing that we did was we realized that it's an environment where you can teach some of the basic concepts of 3D modeling. So the 10 Cube Challenge is an activity that falls into a ninth grade digital foundations course where we're having students kind of like begin to learn how to um, model in 3D environments. And so we have a content skill for the 10 cube challenge. Okay, and this content skill is we want them to replicate the shape of an existing object or an object that, that um, or a thing that exists. And then we want them to apply an understanding of the X, Y, and Z axis in a 3D computer generated environment. Okay, because obviously we're looking at it being three dimensions. So let me just talk about what I mean by this. So this image, um, is um, if you had to guess, this is a model probably of an animal. And I would go as far to say that it's probably a cat. And the reason why I can say it's a cat is because I'm recognizing um, the model by its shape, okay? It's got some legs, it's got a tail, it's got a body, it's got a head. And more importantly, I'm going for a cat because of the point it is, okay? Um, so this student is definitely on their way to demonstrating some understanding of the content. But don't forget, in this content skill, we had that latter part, which was to demonstrate an understanding of the X, Y, and Z axis. So right now, we're looking at the image from um, just two dimensions, okay? We're looking at it along the X and the Y axis. But when we go and look at it along the third dimension, which is the Z axis, you can see that the elements are not together. And this no longer replicates the shape of the object or thing that it's trying to replicate, right? Because the coordinates along the Z axis aren't in line with each other. Okay, so this is what we're trying to have students to understand when they're engaging in the 10 cube challenge. Okay, this is the content skill. So in terms of taking the work of E. Paul Torrance and trying to integrate the teaching of this creativity skill, we integrated one of these beyond the skills that he identified. And that was to be original. We want students to get away from the obvious, breaking away from habit bound thinking, creating novel, different or unusual ideas. And this beyond the skill, I feel, is probably a really important skill, right? Because if you look at the common definition of creativity, it usually has the word new, original, unique, or novel in it, okay? So having students get away from the obvious is really, really important. And unfortunately, time's not gonna allow me to digress, but this is actually one of the reasons why I got into the study of creativity um, as part of the development of the digital media movie making course. Because I think having students getting away from the obvious is something really, really important in terms of success in the 21st century. So let me take you through um, the 10 cube challenge. So the 10 cube challenge required that students develop this model using exactly 10 cube or cuboid shaped prints, okay? So when you think about that, what are the things that usually come up, okay? Now, we've done this challenge a few times, and in terms of originality, you're looking at what occurs frequently. And from experience, 
we kind of like see that ladders and stairs and pyramids, you know, man-made objects that are squared in shape, everyday things, they're the things that tend to occur very quickly when we introduce the student to, uh, introduce students to the 10 cube challenge, or rather sometimes we've introduced teachers to the 10 cube challenge as well. And it, I think it makes complete sense. So when we look at some of the early creations in the 3D virtual world, we see things like the ladder, okay, which is on that list. And we see things, you could argue it's a slightly different variation in shape to the ladder, and now we've got a shelf, okay? And we also saw some pyramids. Now, before I go any further, I just want to talk about another wonderful thing about 3D virtual worlds that we discovered very, very quickly. And that's the environment that they provide, okay? So we've, we, in this particular activity, we had around, it was um, about, seven, about seven schools as part of our Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences participated in this activity, or rather had an opportunity to participate in this activity. So we had about 90 exhibition booths. And I counted at the end of this uh, activity period of around about 73 of those exhibition booths were used. So that's probably about 75% to about 80% of students engaged in this activity in one way or the other. And what's great about it is that you have students go into the exhibition space and all they had to do was find a, 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 an open exhibition area and they had to make sure that their model was contained within that exhibition area because we do have to worry about space in the 3D virtual world. But it was quite possible that you was working alongside students from other school districts, which meant that there was an opportunity for the sharing of ideas okay, that didn't necessarily manifest naturally in the classroom. And I kind of started seeing things like the chair, again, it's, a, it's another kind of like uh, model that you would expect as part of the 10 cube challenge. And then we started to get different variations of the chairs. So when we got one chair, we started to get other chairs. This is kind of like a recliner. And then we kind of got a couch um, uh, or a sofa. I'm not sure what you guys call it in the US, but couch or a sofa. And then we got a bed. And then we got a bed, we got a couple of different variations of bed. Now. Then something magical happened in my mind, something that really got me excited. Um, somewhere about halfway through the challenge, we had a tank come into the 3D virtual world, which was really, really great. We got this tank. And after we got this tank, around the same time, we got a piano. And then we got a swing set. And unfortunately, I can't necessarily explain this phenomena, but all I can tell you is that something happened with these student creations in this world, for all of them to view each other's work, and sometimes before it was finished, it just sparked this kind of, uh, uh, sparked this kind of phenomena where students were going and not only meeting the content skill, but also starting to engage with that creativity skill. And so we got things like a guillotine, and we got a skateboard park, okay? And then we got Indiana Jones rolling, uh, running away from the bowler. So in my mind, these wouldn't be the ideas that you would expect to come up when you think about 10 cube challenge um, uh, models. And they certainly wasn't the activities that we had got that occurred frequently when we had done the activity in the past. So I felt that these models started to meet our creativity skill, okay? Now, just to finish up, I wanted to just talk about one other example that happened around the same time we had the tank and the piano and the swing set. And that was, we had this couch, a student who created this couch, okay? And this was one of the first models that was created in the 3D virtual world, in this exhibition area that we set up. And around about halfway through, around the time we had this tank coming in the swing set, this student went back in world, and what was really great in terms of engagement is I did, I did catch this student in world on a Sunday evening, which was really great to see, along with other students. Um, and he went and did a different model, and he created the TIE Fighter. So I think what that, why this was particularly special is to me, in some ways, it demonstrates um, why I think this activity was a success. Because with the couch, the student had most definitely met the content skill. And I was actually talking with the teacher, and there was some suggestion that he was the best in the class, okay? He's skilled in 3D modeling. And obviously, what happened with this environment is that perhaps this student in a class of 15, 16, 17 was in a good place. He was comfortable. He was the best. But when he was kind of put in a group with 90 students, he realized that he had to go a little bit further. And I think this activity didn't um, challenge students to not only demonstrate an understanding of the content, but by, by providing that creativity skill, we demanded that students learn to be creative and invent something new. And I think this is why 
it's our generation Sputnik moment. Because we're talking about all of these 21st century skills, and they're to be used and applied in a knowledge-based economy. And I think we've all heard about this idea of the knowledge-based economy, but I think it's a place where knowledge is no longer enough. You can't just develop a mastery of the content. You have to go and be creative with it. Now, Howard Gardner says that nations that don't learn how to cultivate creativity are going to get left behind. But here's the really great news, in my, in my opinion. Um, I actually think that we're in a good place because I believe that there is knowledge out there around the creativity phenomena that actually can tell us how to cultivate creativity. And the other great thing that we've got going is we've got this digital, um, digital explosion of digital technologies. So I feel that we need to go to, um, we need to teach the content in middle school, but also integrate the teaching of creativity. We need to go to high school, and we can still teach the content, but integrate the teaching of creativity. But I think more importantly, we need to share this knowledge around creativity at the university level. So we can have a next generation of teachers that know that not only is it possible to teach creativity, but we can actually, um, they actually know how to teach creativity. So I think we can stop talking about creativity now and start teaching creativity. And I think we can do that best by using the power of digital technologies. And these digital technologies can challenge us to think more creatively and teach creativity. Thank you very much.